I am Gino Michelli. I am found one of the founders of the Ground Open Source Data Collection Platform. I'll be presenting today with you um, with Bright Kellogg, our program manager, who is joining us remotely, who is recovering from a very nasty cold, so she couldn't be here in person. You want to say hi, Bright, and uh, kick us off? Hi, everybody. Welcome to Ground. Um, sorry I couldn't be there with you today, but we're really excited to talk with you today about Ground and um, the exciting future we have ahead. So um, we've made some really big strides over the last year in developing this platform, so we, we hope you're excited too. Gino, should I jump into it? Yeah, please do. All right. So a few introductions. In addition to Gino and myself, we have with us today some of our key partners, Andrea and Karis from SIG and Larissa and Herbert from ECOM. So you'll have the opportunity to hear from them today about the field tests that are in the works and some of the work that they've done in the past with us. Here's our roadmap for the session. So first of all, we're gonna talk about what our motivations and challenges are, a basic introduction to what ground is, and then a simple timeline. After that, Gino is gonna walk you through our latest designs and you'll have a chance to really zoom in on these during our user study later in the session. Um, third, we're going to hear from Ecom and SIG about their perspectives on ground. And then we'll have an open Q&A session. So you'll be welcome to ask questions of Gino as well as our other partners. Um, and here's the part that Gino and I are most interested in, which is the user study. We really want to better understand how ground can help your projects achieve their objectives. So we're curious about what you're working on and basically how ground can help. Finally, we'll touch on a few perspective applications um, of ground at the end. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Gino to discuss our motivations um, and uh, some of the challenge that we, challenges that we face. Ready, Gino? Yes, thank you, Bright. Thanks for kicking it off. Right, so uh, why are we doing this? Let's start with why is the most important thing. Um, we have been, we meaning Geo for Good and the, the people behind Geo for Good have been working closely with partners like yourselves for many years, for over a decade. And over that time, we hear patterns, we see things, problems, common problems that you have and common use cases that you have. And one thing that kept popping up was the difficulty in obtaining um, so-called ground truth data, or rather, even better, in situ data, um, collecting and validating information actually on the ground. Next slide, please. Um, one of the problems that users tend to encounter is that existing solutions don't integrate well. They need to use multiple tools to accomplish their tasks. So that means having some technical knowledge in order to integrate different tools together. Next slide. Another problem is that, which is related to the first problem, is that the features, the capabilities that folks need are not found in one place. So in some cases, you have to um, set up your survey in one tool, um, you know, do your mapping in another tool, collect your actual structured data in yet another tool, then the data gets stored in yet another piece of infrastructure. And for many people, this is just a non-starter. People don't, don't have a technical person on staff um, for the length of the project and, and beyond. The third challenge we hear, which is more of a kind of, um, it's a non-technical challenge, is um, either for commercial products, the, the issue of recurring license fees and contracts. So if you build local capacity, for example, on a particular tool or platform, then, and then your project ends and you leave, the local community is stuck having to foot the bill, or you have to find some solution for that. Um, similarly, People uh, like to develop their, their institutional capacity on tools that they have a say in the development of and even can just take the tool and change it and modify it to their own needs if necessary. And that's not possible with a lot of proprietary tools and platforms today. So enter Ground. Ground is an open source, map first data collection platform. And we seamlessly connect the offline world with cloud-based storage and computation. So that's our elevator pitch. Uh, let's talk a little bit about our parameters. So what ground is, first off, we are a volunteer effort um, on the Google side. We are a very enthusiastic cohort of volunteer uh, developers, UX experts, and of course our dedicated partners. Uh, ground is a general purpose data collection solution based on more than 10 years um, of 
of input from our partners on the ground. We'll hear uh-huh. more about that later. And there are so many potential applications across both public and private sectors. Um, Ground is composed of a web app and an Android app, and they work seamlessly in tandem. And finally, Ground is open source. Uh, While we're currently developing Ground with our key partners in mind, we hope and expect that in the future, organizations that employ Ground will customize the code and shape it according to their own needs. So we think that Ground's open source status is actually a real advantage for potential users. Uh, A few caveats. Ground is not a turnkey solution in the way that, say, Gmail is. Uh, Ground will not replace bespoke analysis and visualization systems or focus primarily on data collection. And finally, Ground is not a staff-supported Google product like Gmail, as I mentioned before. Um, On the Google side, our team is composed of 20% contributors who have dedicated one-fifth of their bandwidth to building this platform. So I think that speaks to the confidence that our team has about it. Um, <clears throat> here's a high level timeline of our most recent milestones. So in 2021 and 2022, we conducted a series of user studies and pilots. This year we passed a major milestone. So our MVP re- redesign is complete and we're preparing for field testing by partners. Over the next two quarters, we're so excited to go into the field and see what ground can do. And in 2024, we expect to see Ground operationalized by key partners in a number of major initiatives. So this includes RECI, the UN Decade on Restoration, and the Forest Data Partnership. So now I'm really delighted to hand things off to Gino so he can give you a closer look at the web and Android apps. Thank you, Bright. Yeah, just to reiterate, so that's that makes that ground is really your platform. It's community ground, and we accept contributions from developers. We are working closely with um, under the Forest Data Partnership, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, to develop the web interface. We'll be working more closely with Ecom to develop the Android part of the application. So it's really community ground, not Google ground. Um, so this, what I will show you now is our latest designs, which were created by um, several designers, primarily our latest designer, Victor Stelmasuk, who um, re-envisioned the web and Android experiences, incorporating the feedback we received from the field pilots in 20, the end of 2021. So what you're seeing here is the web console where all of the setup of the survey occurs. Um, So everything in ground happens in the context of a survey. You could think of that as like your Google Doc or your Google spreadsheet. And if you want to create a new survey, you do that through the web interface. Next slide, please. You can set up a survey defining your survey title, survey description. Next slide. And then within the context of a survey, the data is collected as a number of one or more jobs in the survey. So a job can be something like map the cocoa plantations or validate deforestation alerts. Next slide. Then further down within this job, you have the option to actually do data collection on a ad hoc basis, which is the second option I jumped to, map as you go. So people will go to the field and then as they encounter forest disturbances or fires, they will report them and map them. Or you can upload your points and polygons beforehand, say if you have a a statistical sampling design or if you're generating forest alerts, deforestation alerts from like GLAD or your own from Earth Engine, you can do that. And then finally, you have the option to do both. So you have a sampling design, but you don't want to restrict the data collectors from collecting data if they find something interesting in the field. They can still drop a pin or draw a polygon around what they find. Next slide. So this is the interface. If you said that you're going to upload the locations of interest or the data collection sites beforehand, you can do that now uploading a GeoJSON file or a CSV file. You can also back out and say, okay, I don't actually want data collectors to be able to add new locations in the field. I'm going to turn that off. Next slide. From there, you proceed to define the actual data collection task. So what data do you actually want the data collectors to gather? Um, Currently, we support basic question types. So you select one, select many, text. Um, You can also take a photo. 
which will be uploaded to cloud storage for you. Um, you can drop a pin on the map so the user can pan and zoom the map and place the pin where they actually see something happening. Um, they can use their GPS to do that. Um, they can also draw a polygon, so draw a boundary on the map using the, the mobile phone. And finally, there's capture location, which is similar to drop a pin, but they can't pan and zoom the map. It's really where they are on the map. Okay, next slide. And it's intentional. It looks a lot like, I could you go back one? Thanks. It looks a lot like Google Forms. We borrow a lot of the visual language from Google and Google Material because we have the same designers and the same people putting the design into this with all of the research that goes behind it in terms of usability. Right. Okay, next slide. Finally, once your survey is complete, you can share it with the data collectors. So what I've just shown you is the kind of wizard onboarding flow that we created because we want it to be a linear process that makes it really easy for somebody who really want to hold the hand of somebody who's never used this before. You just go step by step and set up your survey. All right. And next. And next again. So you share it with the data collectors by email address, and then you can click go to survey, and it takes you to the next step. You can later come back through the survey editor and modify your survey questions, add new jobs to the survey, add new data collectors, and so on. Okay, next slide. Right, so now we move over to the mobile device. This is an Android-only app at the moment. Um, it's built natively in Android because at the time that we built it, we didn't have very, very many other alternatives like Flutter, which we have today. Um, but we also wanted to integrate tightly with the operating system. So we wanted to be able to run things in the background and also have the install size be quite small so that if you're using older devices, it will still work well. Next slide. So once you sign in using your Google account, you will be so shown the list of surveys which you have access to. Um, as soon as you select a survey, it's automatically all of the data collection sites and the questions that you've defined are downloaded to the device so that they're available offline. That's what this little green check means, available offline. And next slide. Before you go to the field, you may also want to take some imagery with you because say where you're working, there's no internet signal, or even if you do have signal, the map is just blank because you're in the middle of a forest, so there are no actual road features, or, or even if it's flat terrain, you might just see a gray, completely gray map. So um, for the pilot, we've created a Sentinel-2 cloud-free mosaic for 2022, so it's 10 meter resolution. It's available only for Brazil and Indonesia to the internal testers for now. Um, but you can select an area interactively. It'll tell you how much space it'll take up your, on your device. Next slide. Okay, again. Then you'll see the areas that you've downloaded for offline use. Next slide. Back in the main interface, you can toggle between the basic Google Maps layers. You have the roadmap, the terrain, the satellite. Um, those are only available online. And if you're lucky enough, if they're in your cache on your device, you can still see them while you're offline, but there's no guarantees. So that's why this offline map layer is so important, because that's guaranteed to stay on your device until you remove it. It's only 10 meters for the moment, but it still seems to be in testing better than looking at a gray screen when you're trying to orient yourself in the field. Okay, next. Right, so this is the overview view where you see there are clusters of data collection sites scattered around on the map. Um, what, this numbers mean, what these numbers mean is that in this bubble there are nine data collection sites and none of them have data for them yet. Whereas this one, one of the four has data. So the idea here is that before you go to the field, you, you may plan your day or plan your visit by looking at the map and saying, okay, well, we can hit the, there are three missing up there. Let's try and reach there today. It's close to our current location. Next. When you're actually in the field, now this is the part that works, the previous step and this step work completely offline. You can see the areas of interest within your viewport you can tap them and you can swipe these cards at the bottom to look at what the different locations of interest are. So there'll be one for each job that you've defined and one for each data collection site. So in the map, the farm site, someone uploaded an area of interest with this ID. So now I can swipe, see that area of interest and then hit collect data and start gathering data for it. Next slide. One more. 
Right. So then once you hit collect data, you'll be taken through a linear data collection flow, one task at a time. So the survey organizer here defined a question, which is what is the name of the initiative? This doesn't match because it's from the designs, but you get the idea. This could be what type of land do you observe at this location? Next. This is showing you the drop a pin flow where you can pan and zoom the map to put a pin on the map. Next. And then this is what taking a photo looks like. Next. And this is showing you how you draw an area. So you just you drag the map. Should be a sort of familiar experience where you see the area being drawn as you drag. You keep adding points to the polygon until you're done. Next. That's it. And then once your data is gathered, it gets stored on the device until you have a network connection. Um, one of the things we worked hard on is ground is to integrate with the operating system they called workers so that um, when a network connection is available, they wake up in the background and the data collector doesn't need to think about this. The data just gets synced to the cloud. Right. And also, at the same time, any new changes to the surveys or if there are new data collection sites, so say a Forest, a new deforestation alert was generated, they will also get downloaded to the device without any kind of interaction. So all of this is, is so that the data collectors don't need any special training or to do anything extra. They already have their hands full navigating to the actual field sites and collecting the actual data. So the less they have to worry about, the better. Okay, next. Um, this is just showing a, ca a case of what's sometimes called opportunistic data collection or ad hoc data collection, where uh, the data collector may have found a cocoa farm which wasn't actually in the original plan survey. So for all of those jobs that allow that type of data collection, there will be an extra card shown at the end of the list. You can swipe to that card. It's shown in a different color. There's going to be an icon there that will show you, and then you can collect data. And when you start collecting data for this place, you'll be asked first, well, where is this new thing that you found? Please map it for us. And you'll draw your polygon and, and submit it. Next, please. So back in the web interface, you'll see the list of data collection sites shown under the job name. And they will appear in real time. As soon as the data is uploaded in the app, they just appear in the web interface. And as data is submitted, next slide, it appears in the side panel here. Okay. Um, one thing to note is that in traditional GIS systems, you have a, a point has a set of properties, like a key value pair, right? A name and a value. Um, whereas in ground, a data collection site can have more than one data point associated with it. So that means that um, we support remeasurement natively. You can go back to the same tree or to the same farm and add another observation to that farm tree. Um, so what you're seeing here is multiple people have collected data about this particular site. And when that's exported, all of that gets put into one flat file and you can visualize it and analyze it in Earth Engine or other tools. Next. You can also view your data currently in the web interface. We hope to support also data collection and editing through the web. The moment, at the moment, it's only in the mobile device. Next. And then finally, for each job, you can download your data as a CSV at the moment. And the CSV is formatted in a way that you don't need to do any manual tweaking in order to import it into Earth Engine. It just works. Next. This is showing an example of a real file that was just imported directly into Earth Engine for analysis. And the way it works now is that the questions currently show up as properties of the feature collection, if you're familiar with Earth Engine, that you can then use in your analyses. Um, in the future, we plan to create some uh, more programmer-friendly labels, because it's not fun to work with properties that are called algum manejo etc. So we will, working on that, we hope to use something like a, a Palm AI or an AI platform to actually generate those automatically for you so you don't have to type them. Next. Right, so future work. We have a lot of ideas. We have more ideas than we have time at the moment or people. Um, we want to work on training foundation models using this data and integrating those directly into the app. So seeing, for example, a land cover map and then saying, um, okay, I'm going to label this as forest, 
and then seeing the map change in real time, based, even offline, based on your, your answers, and then doing that collaboratively over time. We also, a very popular request has been conditional branching. So if you choose forest for the plot, then you have to answer these questions. If you choose water, then you have to choose the other questions. And similarly, repeated subtasks, so having to do something over and over again, like uh, drop a pin on all the disturbances in this plot. You can still approximate to that in the current model, but we want to support that natively. Um, as I mentioned, we also want to support web-based web data collection. Um, we want to have templates, so you have your land use, land cover classes already defined elsewhere. You just hit a button and then import those in. And lastly, um, linked to the first one, collaborative multiple choice questions. So we don't define the multiple choice question beforehand. We ask users to define that, and then they can see each other's answers so that we can build up that list over time. Next. Uh, potential integrations that we hope to build, and we already have ideas on how these can be built, is having the data be pushed directly into Earth Engine rather than having to download a file and then import it. Um, generating KML, we had an early prototype of this early on so that you can just open your data directly in Google Earth. Um, we also have a prototype of the Google Sheets integration, which we have to revisit. Um, we want to gener generally connect tightly with Collect Earth Online so that those web-based visual classification sites can be turned into ground data collection sites and vice versa. Um, there is a registry of, for ecosystem restoration, which we want to integrate with managed by FAO, the firm, and also looking into gathering the actual data collection sites from the Axstead Asset Registry for easier integration with EUDR compliance initiatives. Yeah. Next. All right, so I've talked at you a lot, and thank you for your patience. I um, want to turn it over to probably one of the more interesting parts of the talk, which will be feedback from our pilot partners. In, 2000, in 2021, we had pilots with ECOM and Severe and other partners who, have take, who took an early prototype of ground to the field before the current redesign, and we want to give them a chance to talk to you about their experiences. So yeah, I'll shut up now and pass it over to Larissa and Hebridge from ECOM. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> é... Bom dia. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. É... Eu vou apresentar alguns trabalhos que a gente fez utilizando o ground juntamente com comunidades quilombolas. I'm going to present to you some works that we have done uh, using Ground App uh, together with some Quilombola communities. Próximo slide. Next. É a introdução, então, à equipe de conservação da Amazônia. Ela trabalha diretamente com comunidades quilombolas e pequenos produtores rurais. Uh, ECAM, which is uh, a equipe... Equipe de conservação. Oh, equipe de conservação. It's a conservation for the Amazon uh, staff, and we work directly with. Com diretamente com. Com comunidades tradicionais. With traditional communities. E pequenas propriedades rurais. And also small properties. Ok. E quais são os principais dados que a gente coleta, né? São dados socioeconômicos, né? É dados de inventário florestal, a gente utiliza o Graud para fazer inventários florestais participativos, então são os próprios comunitários que vão lá e faz o inventário florestal. Ok, so uh, we work to collect data, especially on socioeconomic and farming uh, pro products uh, that they, they do in the farming. And... It's, uh, and also soil uh, samples to know how are they uh, sustainable. Então todos esses dados é para subsidiar um projeto que a gente está atuando agora que a Larissa falou lá embaixo. All of this data is to give information to the project that we are working on right now, which was presented earlier que é o comércio de carbono em pequenas propriedades. Which is the carbon market for smallholder farmers. É, e com comunidades quilombolas. And also quilombola communities. Ok. 
Bem, é, os dados mais importantes que a gente levanta, isso aí foi uns dados é, que a gente teve como teste, foi com comunidades quilombolas no Amapá. Ok, e... so the most important data that we're gathering uh, are with uh, quilombola communities in, in Amapá and Goiás. Uh, Amapá is in the Amazon forest and Goiás in Brazilian Cerrado. A comunidade da Sandra que teve lá embaixo. That includes Sandra's community. Né? É, bem, aí o que, que a gente fez? Fez os levantamentos de como eles produzem, da forma é, tradicional que eles produzem, né? So, we try to understand how they produce their crops, what is their, are the traditional uh, ways that they plant. Fizemos todo o levantamento socioeconômico da, da comunidade. We also, also gather all the socioeconomic information from the community para fomentar o cálculo de nível de vulnerabilidade daquela comunidade. That is important to understand how vulnerable this community is. Para a gente estar tá acompanhando ano a ano esse principal índice. And we are trying to monitor year by year uh, how that evolves and how uh, the vulnerability changes over time. E fazemos também os levantamentos de biomassa aérea, fazendo os inventários florestais. Uh, we also collect data on uh, above ground biomass and soil sampling. E os, uh, as amostras de solos também, que são tudo para alimentar o algoritmo para a gente fazer a, a medições de carbono daquela propriedade. These last two are important to measure carbon content and uh, feed the algorithm that we are trying to develop right now. Juntamente com as imagens que a Larissa trabalha. That is together with remote sensing images, which is my field of work. Ok, next slide. Bem, é, por que o Ground? O Ground em si ele é uma ferramenta bastante amigável, principalmente para comunidades é, tradicionais, no qual eles podem acompanhar a própria produção, construindo seu próprio formulário. Ok, so why Ground? Uh, it is very important for the community to be able to work with the, the apps themselves. Uh, and it's an uh, interface that is favorable for them to learn how to use it and take it to the field. E ele, daí eles já podem desenhar, fazer um mapeamento da área deles né, com as devidas informações que eles querem levantar. So it helps... Uh, that they can do all the mapping and gather the information that they judge are important. E essa interface amigável que o Dino apresentou de estar tá podendo construir seu próprio formulário. And that helps that the user-friendly interface allows them to construct their own uh, forms of the survey, so the questions and everything. É, já trabalhamos com algumas outros aplicativos no passado e o Grau demonstrou a maior facilidade de construção no formulário. We Foi have worked with other apps in the past uh, and Ground was by far the easiest one for them to to use uh, and it was very simple to teach. Next slide. Ok. Uh, os próximos passos aí são fazer um, um teste com comunidade, pequenas propriedades de cacau na Bahia. So the next steps uh, we're going to test with 75 small farmers of cocoa farmers in Bahia. É fazer o levantamento de como eles produzem esse cacau. We're trying to gather information on how they produce uh, this, this cocoa. Tá, vamos fazer todo o mapeamento da área. And all the mapping of the areas. É, vão coletar todas as informações de integração ao projeto. Então, aquele produtor vai inserir as informações dentro do ground. Uh, and they're going to collect themselves all the information that are going to be integrated in the project. Vão, vão realizar através do ground também as coletas de solo com treinamento. And uh, we're going to use... Uh, ground to make the soil samples collection also. E os inventários participativos, se for necessário, também vai ser usando o ground. 
And if we need to, uh, we're going to do uh, participatory inventories. So we're try trying to train uh, the communities to do the forest inventories themselves and put the information into ground. E a ECAN, junto com a RECID, está tentando expandir para mais três países, que seria o Egito, o Congo e a Colômbia. And right now we have the possibility to expand this project to three other countries, uh, Egypt, Con Congo and also Colombia. Acho que acabou. <coughs> Next slide. Acabou. Ok. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Herbers. Thank you, Larissa, for the real-time translation. Really appreciate it. Right. So um, great. Now up next we have uh, Andrea and um, Andrea from Severe will be presenting to us on the TerraBio pilot. Thank you. Thanks, Gino. Hi, everyone. Good morning. All right, so I'll be sharing how we have used ground during a few data collection we did uh, to monitor biodiversity impact. Next slide, please. Similar agenda to ECOM, just sharing what we're trying to do. Uh, how was that ground pilot project? Key benefit and lessons learned and how we're gonna use ground in the future, which are really excited. Next slide, please. So all of this work is part of a larger effort to uh, measure biodiversity impact from sustainable and conservation practices. So this is, uh, you know, I think there's a big push to integrate not only carbon metrics, but biodiversity metrics as well. When we're dealing with climate change, how to measure that. So um, we've been trying to, you know, have these projects where we are able to monitor uh, biodiversity impact from these uh, sustainable practices. Um, next slide. And we do that by integrating the biodiversity data we collect in the field with remote sensing technologies to provide a greater picture of how the landscape dynamics have been changing and how those sustainable practices have been impacting that landscape. So for the, this project specifically, we have worked uh, with Servia Amazonia, with our local partner in Brazil, Ima Flora, uh, and this is part of the TerraBio approach. Um, so we, we worked with them, we did this field data collection in São Félix do Xingu, in Pará, in Brazil, in 2021. And uh, we had the team collect the biodiversity data there, take photos, all of that, using the ground app. And then that uh, information collected helped us interpret the eDNA data. So I'm going to explain quickly what's that. And then that uh, by contextualizing the conditions and land management activities at each of those different land use sites. So what we basically do, we take soil samples as well from the ground. We take that not only from that intervention site where the sustainable practice takes place, but also from like a reference site that is a conserved forest patch, for example, and then a counterfactual land use, which can be pasture land in Brazil, that's very common. Uh, and then, you know, take that uh, soil sample that contains environmental DNA or eDNA for short. That's basically just traces of DNA from community species that is sent to a lab and then we are able to have a picture of how, you know, the biodiversity differs from those different um, land uses. Next slide, please. Some of the ground benefits, we really loved working uh, with ground, as mentioned here several times, relative, it has a relatively simple user interface. You have the ability to set everything ahead of time, so we have organized that can set up the survey with the specific questions that data collectors on the field are able to need to collect. So that being uh, set up previously, when you're like in the office with internet connection is great, and then the data collectors, before going to the field, they're able to download everything, the imagery, as Gino mentioned, that is really, really helpful. They can go, go on the, on the, on to the field data collection and collect everything accordingly, very seamlessly, easy uh, to use. And then offline, of course, I mean, we are working in the Amazon and we don't have a lot of uh, internet connection there. So the offline use is a really uh, groundbreaking, I think, here. Also, super interesting, amazing is that the photos, when you take a photo, let's say you want to associate a specific, you saw something on the field, that specific cropland, you want to take a photo, that is automatically associated with the plot, with the site. Sorry, I'm using plot here and all the, because of collector line. But uh, with the site data, and you know, you 
for those of you who work with data collection, you know the struggle when you're on the field. You take a photo, you need to take a, you know, a note on your, maybe you use another app like a notepad on your cell phone saying like, I took a photo at this time because this associates with this site that I was looking at at the moment and then like the angle and, and many different uh, information. So that is really easy because everything is associated already. And then um, when the users are also walking, the, there's the ability to track that user location so you can make sure they are on the correct site, not, you know, doing things. <laughs> you can assist them to, to, to go to the correct location. Next slide. So plans to use, we are planning to continue working for biodiversity monitoring, so using ground with other uh, organization companies as, as well that are interested in these uh, biodiversity monitoring and also uh, for future remote sensing reference data collection campaigns that focus on ending commodity-driven deforestation. So we have actual, actually a field trip planned for next month in Pará where we're going to collect some perennial crop data and also uh, oil palm data collection in, in Indonesia. Next slide. And then, yeah, what does ground allow you to accomplish that you, you wouldn't have otherwise been able to do? So free and open source uh, software, I think Gino, you know, that slide that uh, has a summary of the advantages between the other uh, apps is, is really uh, straightforward. Also with these like advantages of having uh, being able to set everything beforehand and the offline use, that uh, really make the data collection faster, which yields in cheaper costs. And you know, in developing countries, that's really, really important. Um, as I mentioned, the offline data collection automatic sync sync when when online is also very nice. Uh, let's say um, you know you're there if you, as soon as you get you're offline on collecting data, but as soon as you get back, if you have online, if you have internet, everything is already pushed. Then you you can. Uh, the organizers can already start looking at the data. So that's really uh, useful. And then we are really excited as well for the integration with existing Google ecosystem. So we work a ton with Collector of Online, for example, or even like CPOL, uh, the files big data platform for forest monitoring. Uh, integrating everything will be uh, amazing. We're really excited for that. And then we've been seeing that, you know, there's current demand of tools that assist the private sector to report on their sustainability. And we think ground will help, help us a ton to use that in our work we have with, with these companies. And I think that's it. Oh, there's one more. Yeah, there is a, <laughs> if you wanna check out more about this work and Ecom's work as well, there is a Medium blog post. You can scan the QR code, it's only six minute read. So no excuses here. And you can learn more about, <laughs> about what, what we, we have been doing. And, that's, and I think that's it. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think I misspoke. Andrea from Spatial Informatics Group, collaborator with Server Amazonia. Right, so um, next up, we would love to have your input because this is a platform that's been shaped by the community and we want it to continue to be so. So um, if you could take out your laptops, if you have them, um, you probably can do this on your mobile phone as well, but when you open this link, it's bit.ly slash ground user survey with dashes, not with underscores. Um, you'll see there are two links in the form. Those will take you to a clickable prototype of ground. Okay, it's not the actual implementation, so you can't do everything, but it kind of holds your hand, it guides you through all of the parts of the user interface. So you can use these as reference on your PC. Um, if you don't have that, then you can still fill out the form from your phone, from your mobile phone. Um, so we're going to take 15 minutes. So we are at five, so 10 after. We'll we'll stop for questions and for conclusions. Uh, yeah, let me know. Also, let me know in the process if you have any questions, because while we're doing this, we can use that as an opportunity to to preempt some questions now. Thanks. Is it working? Yes. Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions. I've been through the. Um, the demo uh, in Figma for the web app, uh, no, the Android app. And uh, my first question is, is it possible once someone has actually loaded some geometries to edit them afterward? I'm thinking about several use cases. One would be I'm loading GLAD deforestation events. And then when I'm doing the visual interpretation, I'm realizing that, of course, those pixels are not representing the exact delineation of what has been deforested. 
And my second question is, if it's possible, and I'm editing it on my phone, how did you handle, and that's a design question, uh, drawing on the phone? That's extremely difficult. I mean, maybe I have big fingers, I don't know. But it's extremely difficult to draw a correct polygon, so I would like to know what are the tricks that you've used to make it usable. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good questions. Um, so the first question was, can you edit a polygon once you've added a data collection site, right? So right now you cannot do that. Um, we plan to have some basic editing features in the web app. It's going to have done right now. Um, but you will be able to do that through the data collection sites panel list to customize. You might not want to do that if people have already been collecting data because then you might have uncomparable results because you collected data about one area and now you collect about another. So an alternative is also to add another data, like to remove the old one and add a new one so that it gets a different ID and it's, it's represented separately. But you should be able to edit yeah, eventually, yes. Um, it seems like you had a follow-up to that. Yes, uh, I actually have one use case in mind where the information is actually the geolocation, which is EUDR, which was cited in your first slide. And then and there I want to 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 modify the geometry because the information is the geometry, not exactly the metadata that mm -hmm. I actually store on it. Right. Say say that again. So what is like like you were challenge? saying, if I'm modifying the, the geometry, then yeah. the information that I put in the survey may not be correct anymore and I should be refilling the survey. Right. But for EUDR, the information is it's the geometry. The geometry and right. the rest is right. just right. metadata about the farmer, the plot and right. what's growing on it. Fair enough. Then you can change it. It's it's uh, <laughs> up to you whether we don't enforce the methodology. So if you know, if you have completely open you're just doing a mapping task and you want to just draw things as you see them, and that's actually what you're collecting, then that's great. But if you're doing a st predefined sampling design, you know, then it's different. You're, it's up to you to not allow that to happen. Um, to your second question, um, remind me again, it was how do we handle the drawing area on the device? Rather than tapping locations, we use a, a pan and zoom type of method. So you pan the map, there's a crosshairs, and then you add a point. And then you pan and you add. So you have more control over the individual vertices. And then you can undo the previous point if you need to and do it again. Okay. Looking forward for the demo. So that yeah, I can come on by. With it. I'm happy to show you that. Thanks. You want to pass this down? We'll come back there now. Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, Welcome back. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me first acknowledge the good work that you've done because I think when you first... Uh, this was like about three years ago when you first did this. Yep. This was really, um, it was in its raw state. So this is really looking good. Thank you. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions. And also you did a good job of uh, um, uh, basically saying what the future looks like, that the things you need to improve. It's like you wanted us, the, you had anticipated the things we are going to say. How can, how can I branch? How can I improve on uh, validation? Yep. The branching and the validation questions and adding like limits to questions, like, you know, all that stuff. But then also, do I have leeway to host my data like where I want? Like, can I design like a Tomcat server somewhere and be able to do, deploy, make my own deployments? I collect the data, but then I control where I want the data to be. Because also there could be concerns when, yeah. when yeah. you host it on uh, Firebase. Mm -hmm. And then people say, oh, no, privacy issues and stuff like that. So I wanted to know whether I can, in the future, are you considering that I may not have the budget? Like right now, when I was filling in the form, I realized there's a, you have a question somewhere you know, whether you need my credit card information. So Right. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Currently, it's only on Firebase, unfortunately. Um, I can't make it. Um, it is open source, so if you had uh, the will and the resources to build your own Firebase, your own Tomcat, your own you know, personal database backend, in theory, you could. But at the moment, it's all built on Firebase. Yeah, thanks. Remy, you had a question? It was more a reaction to what uh, Pierrick was mentioning in terms of user case when you have to potentially modify the geometry. And I think most of the times when we're going to have like small holders, um, with this, the, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the four hectares limits will actually make it simple because they will only need a point rather than just the full geometry. And I'm not sure you want to actually be in the field with your mobile device to draw a complex geometry that is above four hectares. So if you're there, you just need to tap the info and you just need to be just in one coordinate point, right? For anything that's below four hectares. 
So I, I think that's the yeah I, I think that sh that that will work with the features that are currently here at that stage. But I'm really interested with the questions that were asked on the on Firebase also, and I yeah. think we should follow up on that. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Okay. We are, have a, we have, I think we have just one, one minute for questions, and we're going to have transition. Actually, I'll just talk. Can we talk after? Then we can have a longer conversation. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. So we're not rushed. Right. Thank you for your questions. I think we'll um, move on to the last part now. I think uh, Bright is going to take over and talk to us about what's next. You're muted. Thank you. So the amount of interest and enthusiasm we've seen over the past two years has been really inspiring for the team from so many different projects and entities. And it's been a real motivator, I think, for our team to get this platform off the ground. So here you can see a few of the prospective use cases. My favorite is sea turtles. Um, and it's, it's really, really exciting to see so many potential uses. So thank you um, for your contributions to the user survey in particular, because we're excited to learn more about what the needs are and um, what people are hoping to do. Um, so now we're going to open up the floor for our Q&A. Um, happy to address any questions about ground and feel free also to address questions to our partners um, as well. So Gino, you want to take some yeah, questions well, from the audience? Sorry for the back and forth on questions. It's a natural. Uh, thank you very thank much you. for this amazing effort. Uh, it's much needed. Uh, so I have a bunch of questions I've written down. So first question is about the type of files and shape files that are loadable. You said GeoJSON and CSV, possibly like a WKD of some sort, right? Um, in the CSV, that's currently, I believe, only point data through CSV. Okay. Polygons and points through GeoJSON. But that's, you know... We're constantly building part pieces of it that are most requested. So if that bubbles up and it's a need, it could be built. It's so may I please request WKDs? They are uh, massively useful, well-known yep. text, and that those are like very easily kind of uploadable, and they are easily in sheets. The second comment I have is uh, in agriculture, especially in the U.S., um, with farmers just contributing shape files of their fields. To FSA, they are offered in the form of shape files, so they are dot .shp. That's the most common mm. geospatial data that we encounter. And most often, I'm up all night just converting sh shape files to geospatials and WKDs, and there are projection issues. So if shape files are acceptable, then that'd be like a huge game changer yeah. for agriculture applications. Mm. So just as a as a thought there. Noted. Uh, yeah, the thanks. second thing is again files, uh, PDFs. Are they allowed as uh, attachments to the uh, forms? Uh, we don't have file attachments right now. Is that something that the data collectors would upload as a PDF? Yes. So these are, uh, let's say that they have nitrogen applications and fertilizer applications, and they have PDFs or receipts and other things that we are collecting to un understand what the practices are. These are extremely essential. Uh, they also have uh, pictures in the form of PDFs. PDFs are like a hugely... Mm. Um, interesting, interesting kind of okay format. yeah thanks for the feedback I hadn't hadn't heard that before oh, wow. but we should discuss more about that I feel oh, like sure. I just need to have a session with you yeah. I give you like 60 minutes of feedback so come by I'm, <laughs> I'm here all day <laughs> so uh, I can give you more questions here but I, I'd like to, like to sit down with you and kind of talk chat with you about yeah yeah let's follow up after the session and then we can figure out how we can maybe have some time to have longer questions thank you very much it's good, good feedback. We'll file those as feature requests. Okay, um, just like a little bit as a follow-up. I don't know whether I know it's Q&A, but also, can it also be like a, a feature request? Uh, what is the, qu the feature request, sorry? Like if uh, we are working with farmers, and can the farmer be able to, like, to calculate the area of the field, of the, of the plot of land? Is that something that is yes. possible that they're able to to submit and then either by moving t through the plots and capturing like the locations, the GPS locations, yeah. they're able to compute like the area of then because this information will help on like on resource allocation, fertilizers and stuff mm. like that, fertilizer application. So to actually calculate the area of the plot? Yes. Yes. It could be done. It could be done. It's not currently how it works, but it's, it's definitely possible. I mean, the, the way we implemented the polygon drawing was intentional that 
you don't it doesn't record your tracks as you walk around because people don't always walk in a perfect you know walk perfectly walk the boundary there are obstacles so we allow them to actually lock to their gps location and as they walk they decide where they drop the pin okay and then when they get to the end back to the beginning and you close then we could say you know so and so, so many square kilometers or hectares okay but it doesn't currently do that okay thank you here i'll give you my microphone but you need this one to answer <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. yeah uh, so the first question is, when do I get to use this? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I think um, we want to get through our pilots now. We're we're doing field work at the end of this year and the beginning of next year. Once we've tested, bug fixed, um, then we will put instructions online of how to install this in Firebase yourself and get up and running. So I think probably, and you're going to quote me on this. I know it probably like early, mid next year, there should be self-serve instructions of how to check it out and just do it yourself. Okay. So the next question I had was in regards to like uh, workflows and user roles. So imagine I am somebody who's in charge and I'm in charge of like a team of rangers who's doing uh, environmental monitoring. Mm -hmm. Am I able to like have a administrator view to assign, assign jobs to different people yeah. to say, okay, this is your area, this is your area. Mm -hmm. And then I see like everything that everybody has done. Um, how how does that work in terms of user permissions and roles? Yeah, we we considered. Um, it's a good question. We considered doing this at the software level and having assigned specific places to specific people, but it added a lot of complexity to the interface. And in many cases, the people you're working with are compliant. They're working. They're, you know, they have the same mission. So we assume that that's something that's coordinated between the survey organizer and the data collector. Again, all of these things can be built. They just, you know, they were left out. So, okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Good question. Thanks. All right. Um, unfortunately, I think we're out of time, but uh, I really appreciate that there's so much excitement and so many questions still pending, which means that we can continue to speak. Um, you know, I'll be here today and tomorrow. And um, if you haven't filled out the questionnaire already, please finish that questionnaire and we will collate and analyze the results. If you sign up to our announcements mailing list, we'll send you a summary, an aggregated uh, summary of the results, anonymized. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming. Hope to see you at the demo station at 6 p.m. today. Thanks. Thank and thank you, Bright. Yeah, thank you. Please and join to our, our announcements list. If you're interested in getting updates or you want to know when it's ready to play with, please join our announce list. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.